So <clears throat> good afternoon to everybody who's joining us online. Uh, the way that this system works, it always takes a couple of minutes uh, for this online room to fill up. Uh, but as people are entering our virtual space, I do want to welcome you here. My name is Warren Mabey. I'm the director of the School of Policy Studies here at Queen's. Uh, and it's um, uh, you know, a delight to be able to have you here uh, to take part in our policy talk series. In a moment, I'm going to hand over to uh, Professor Goodyear Grant, who's going to be moderating today's session. But I just wanted to call your attention to a few upcoming uh, talks and sessions that we have uh, on the schedule. Uh, next week on April 6th, uh, we have the Clark Lecture, which is going to be uh, presented by Professor Kashik Bazu uh, from Cornell University. Uh, on the 7th, we're going to be talking about municipal governments in the pa post-pandemic world, and our speaker is James Pasternak, uh, who is a city councillor with the City of Toronto. Uh, and then finally, on April 12th at 4.30 uh, p.m., uh, we are very delighted to be welcoming Her Excellency, uh, the Governor General of Canada, Mary Simon, who will be speaking to us um, uh, in the Tom Cruchane Distinguished Speaker Series. I know that's really going to be a, an interesting and, and important talk. So please mark your calendar with all of those upcoming events. Uh, we uh, really look forward to seeing you there. Before I hand over to Elizabeth, uh, I would like to just recognize that I'm sitting here at Queen's University and Queen's is situated on the traditional territories of the Haudenosaunee and the Anish Anishinaabe peoples. Uh, it is our privilege to be able to work here and to study here and to learn here. Um, and I, I'd like to point out, you know, Cataraqui, our city or our territory uh, has been a place that uh, has seen the gathering of people over many millennia uh, where people would come together to meet and to hunt and to fish and to exchange ideas and exchange thoughts. Uh, and I like to think that Queen sort of carries on that tradition. And that is what we're doing here in this virtual setting uh, that we're sitting in today. I know that as you join us, you may be coming from many different traditional territories or homelands. Uh, do give some thought to that as we go forward. And then finally, I'd like to introduce Professor Goodyear Grant, Elizabeth, uh, who comes to us from the Department of Political Studies here at Queen's. Um, Elizabeth, I'd like to hand over to you, and thanks very much. Thanks very much, Warren. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have everyone here today and to be able to introduce our speaker. Um, so Ian Garner's research is in cultures of Russian and Soviet propaganda. Uh, he's written for outlets, uh, including Foreign Policy, The Washington Post, and The Calvert Journal. His first book, Stalingrad Lives, Stories of Combat and Survival is coming out this year with McGill Queens University Press. And it explores how the USSR's leading prose writers created an enduring myth of Stalingrad at the front in 1942 to 43. Um, Ian graduated with a PhD from the Department of Slavic Languages and Literatures at the University of Toronto. Uh, after studying at the University of Bristol and St. Petersburg State Conservatory in Russia. He has taught Russian language, literature, history, and politics at the university level, and is obviously deeply expert in the issues that we're going to hear about today. Thank you, Ian, for joining us, and thanks to all attendees for coming as well. Ian, the floor is yours. Perfect. Well, thank you for having me, everybody, and thank you for inviting me, Elizabeth, to talk about this uh, somewhat depressing and strange uh, world that we've been living in for the last few weeks. And if you think that your world has been strange for the last few weeks, then my world has been perhaps a few steps stranger. For I have chosen to immerse myself for, I suppose, almost in a, month, a month and a half now in the world of Russian state propaganda. And I spent pretty much all of my time reading Russian social media feeds, Telegram channels, digging into nationalist groups, speaking to Russian state agents, so people working in the public sector, people working for the Russian government, talking to ordinary Russians as well, and trying to figure out what is it like to experience this war on the Russian side. And this is extremely hard to do. We're all living in, there is an excellent new book coming out, Radical War by Andrew Hoskins and Matthew Ford. And it explores the topic of war nowadays being 
fed and experienced principally through social media as much as the battlefield and the ties between the battlefield and social media and argues that social and the information war actually has an impact on the battlefield. As we kind of create our own feeds and our own worlds and realities by choosing to subscribe and unsubscribe to feeds, to like posts, to mute and block people, we create a reality for ourselves and charting the reality for Russians is even harder. For 15, 20 years or so, the Russian government has been creating splintered and shattered realities for its own people. What Peter Pomerantsev calls a hall of crooked mirrors and illusions. And if you want to understand Russian propaganda, this book by Pomerantsev, Nothing is True and Everything is Possible, it's a couple of hundred pages long. It's available as a cheap paperback. This is the book you need. It's a great read and it's, it's absolutely fascinating. But as we meet online and as Russians meet online, these disjunctures and these illusions and crooked and shattered mirrors as their realities collide with ours, it can be hard to figure out for us sitting at our desktop screens in provincial Canada, as most of us probably are right now, what's really going on. And when we see some of the images, like the first images I, image I have here, our reactions are often quite extreme. So this was, I don't know if you saw this video, this was the video that broke the Z campaign a few days after the invasion. And it has these shouty guys with their Z tops and their flags. They wave these about a bit and the guy shouts some patriotic pablum. And lots of the reactions were understandably maximalized, that this is the birth of a new fascism, that the Z looks like a swastika. And what I want to explore today is whether we are seeing a new generation of younger Russians, because, you know, all of these people in this picture look like they're millennials, maybe people in their early 20s, maybe student age people, or whether we're seeing something different. And I've called it fascism or failing state. I don't think Russia's a failing state, but I like the alliteration, so I apologize. Let's dig into this then. And some of the images we've seen really do look overtly fascist. And we haven't seen this phenomenon in Russia before. But in the last few weeks, we've seen images spread on social media of words being daubed, of actions being taken against the doors of people who are deemed to be traitors. So on the left, we have an anti-Semitic attack on Alexei Venediktov, who is the editor or was the editor of Echo of Moscow, the radio station that was shut down. You can see a pig's head has been dropped outside of his door. In the middle, this is a civil rights activist. The word reads traitor in red. And on the right hand side, you can see the Z and the V, the Latin script. And the words read, don't sell out the motherland, bitch. And I apologize, there'll probably be some more bad language and pretty, pretty crass stuff here. And many people understandably have gone to the comparison with Juden, the 1930s with Kristallnacht, with the fascist kind of motifs and symbols that we know how to read these things by. When we look at the creations of the state, meanwhile, you might have seen the images of Putin's big victory concert, that of course was not a victory concert as it turned out on the 18th of March. This is at the Lushniki Stadium, which is the national stadium in Moscow. And this drew comparisons to Nuremberg. Russians were bust in. There were um, like Olympic gold medalists from the Winter Olympics. There were some big pop stars that played and then Putin made a speech in this coat that it turned out cost 10,000 euros or something obscene like that until the tech failed and his speech cut out. And the obvious comparison lots of people made on social media was to Nuremberg. And I, I'm not sure whether the comparison works or not, but you, you see what I'm getting at that there are fascistic elements at play here. Then we hear that opinion polls are telling researchers that Russians are broadly in support of this war, that 58% of Washington Post support the war, that there is a growing anti-war momentum, that Navalny has produced this poll from presumably his uh, compatriots have helped him out from his jail cell. And then this one was widely spread. 71% of Russians feel some sort of positivity about the war. I'd be really wary of any polling that comes out from a state like Russia. Um, if anyone's interested, I can share you with you at the end. Um, there was a great blog post by a guy called Jeremy Morris, who's an anthropologist slash sociologist at Aarhus University in Denmark. 
And he really took these polls apart and showed that you, they're, they're really not worth the paper they're printed on. They don't mean much. They don't tell us much about Russians and what Russians think. So if we're going to ask, and this is what we're asking today, what do Russians really make of the war, especially young Russians who are interpreting their world through social media and constructing reality of the war through social media. If we're going to ask, and I'm going to try and ask this at the end, although it's very much guesswork, what can we expect to see in the future? We can't trust polls. So what I'm going to do instead today is to think about discourse, words, phrases, and to think about symbolism and image i.e. the things I've been pointing to already, and think about those through the lens of subjectivity. And if you're not familiar with this, the idea of subjectivity is something that's been increasingly used in Soviet and post-Soviet studies, cultural studies, literary studies, history, to make sense of how ordinary people experience life in an authoritarian state to make sense of how people frame and reframe their existence around images and words and using images and words used by the state. And the shorthand that I will use is to talk about this idea came from Jade McGlynn, who is a scholar who was at Oxford and is now working at Middlebury in uh, California. The difference between engagement and engagingness when it comes to subjectivity. And I really like these terms, they're simple, but they work. So when we think about the way that people engage with materials produced by the state, we might talk about real engagement, where people make conscious choices to take a deep interest in narratives of the present and the past. People may arrive at the position that the state desires, but they have to take some decisions to get to that destination, right? Versus engaging this, which is very superficial, is performance-based, it's reflexive, it's a gut reaction, it's a reproduction of symbolism which is unthinking. So we're going to talk about where, where the Russians are really displaying engagement or engagements. Let's talk then about this said campaign, which is the image you've all seen and indeed the discourse that Russians are all hearing. And the words I've put at the top here, Zarasio Zamir Zapavtarienia, you can see I've included the Latin eight Z, this is not the Russian Z, I'll show you what that looks like in a second. And the words mean, and this is the, these are the phrases that we're hearing, Zarasio for Russia, Zamir for peace. And yes, this is topsy-turvy, this is wild stuff, no one can possibly believe Russians are fighting for peace, but this is the slogan that they're using. And lastly, Zapavtarienia, which means for a repeat. And in this case, a repeat of the Second World War, a repeat of the idea of saving the world from a fascist threat. Now these Z and V symbols seem to have been adopted because they are what has been used on the operational groupings of military vehicles in Ukraine itself. So you can see on the left-hand side there, you've got the Z daubed on the tank, on the right-hand side there, the V on the, the troop carrier and the downed helicopter. And it, it looks like pretty makeshift work with which they've uh, thrown these symbols on before the invasion, which perhaps tells us something about the planning that they might have undertaken before choosing to invade. And I think that the adoption of the Z and V as a wider kind of social media campaign, a campaign aimed at the population, reflects a kind of ad hoc thinking that we're seeing from the government. It's pretty clear by now that they intended this to be a rapid war, that they would strike through to Kiev. 72 hours is being banded around as the completion time. I don't know whether that's true or not, but they aim for Blitzkrieg and it hasn't worked out. If you're going to motivate your population to buy into a much bigger and longer and more costly war in terms of money and in terms of lives, you need some way to unite them. And I think that some social media genius in the Kremlin, or perhaps not genius, has latched onto Z and V as possible symbols and decided to use them and throw them out to the wider population. The Z and V may also stand for Zapadivostok, which means West and East. Again, that could be part of the military operational groups, but it also has a kind of allusion to the, the clash of civilizations that Russians are being told that this war is about that this war is a war of Western values and the West encroaching on and threatening to obliterate Russia and Russian values. And what we're seeing is that Z and V, the Latin characters, are being thrown into Russian words. 
So there is the Russian Z, Z, which looks like a number three, and the Russian V, which looks like our letter B. And the beauty of this, if you're creating a social media campaign, is that anything can become Zedized. And I apologize, it's a horrible word, but I couldn't think of a better way to put it. Almost any word in Russian can have Z or V in it, and therefore you might find these all over the place. And indeed, that word za, za rasiu, za mir, za eta, za to, za means for. So for Russia, for peace. I've also seen for justice, for unity, for the future, for the children, right? This is a very kind of plastic meaning. Z can appear everywhere. But we have to ask, does this really encourage engagement, a deep reflection, or is the symbol so plastic, so applicable to anything that this can only ever produce engaging mess? And here are a couple of examples of how the Russian world is becoming Zedized. This is the town of Zugris, which is in the east of Ukraine, it's in the Donbass, and there Russian Z, that nice curvy three figure, has been replaced with a Western Z. Here is, if my computer will load it, I apologize, it's being a little bit slow. Here is another shot from that big stadium performance. At the top we have Zamir bez Nazism, for a world without Nazism, and Zaresiu underneath it for Russia. And the Zs once again have been replaced. We also see a kind of plasticity, a remaking of meaning, a reappropriation of symbols when it comes to this black and orange stripe device that you might have seen. This is the St. George ribbon, and the St. George ribbon plays in Russian martial culture something like the role of the remembrance poppy here. And you can see on the left here, this is an image that was produced in the Soviet era for Victory Day, 9th of May, the, the anniversary of the Second World War. And you can see that this ribbon is twisted into the figure nine. There is an inherent plasticity in that image. And now what do we see? You might well have seen this form of the Z. The Z being matched with not just the current Z campaign, but also with campaign the image, the memory of World War II, the repeat. And here the hashtag is we don't abandon our own our own being Russian speakers or what are called ethnic Russians, whatever that might mean, in Ukrainian territory. And these are being sort of turned into a whole series of bricolage images on the internet on what's called the Runet, the, the collection of patriotic groups on Telegram and VK, which is the Russian sort of equivalent of Facebook. So on the left-hand side, we get this almost sort of video game-esque image which again matches very modern symbolism with the black and the orange of the St. George ribbon. These are images that we wouldn't pick up on necessarily that immediately signal something to Russians. On the right-hand side, this is my favorite because this one's got a bit of everything. This is just a patchwork of images thrown together in the hopes of creating something that is engaging. So now we see the A inverted to become a Z, uh, a V rather, we see the Western Z as well, so we see ZV. Zabudushia is the phrase at the top for the future. The red font of future looks like it. this is a sort of Soviet era retro font, immediately recognizable to Russian speakers. At the bottom, the caption reads, a world after victory. And of course, the terms of victory still aren't clear. So this is a very sort of random collection of ideas without much to pull it together. We see the image of the child, which is of course an allusion to the future. And then on the right hand side, what do we see? But the great Stalingrad monument, the motherland calls again, a reference to the epic battles of the past. So we might ask, is that kind of superficial imagery that seems thrown together really taking off? It seems to be everywhere and it's been spread widely by the media. But when I looked on March the 8th, so this was a few weeks ago now, I looked on Instagram, only of the top, two of the top 30 posts using this hashtag za, i.e. four, which crops up in lots of different circumstances in Russian, of course, related to the Z campaign, related to the war in some way. None of the top hashtags using za in some way related to the Z campaign, to the military campaign. The hashtag Zaresiu for Russia had only 80,000 posts. 
compared to millions for some of the other hashtags that began with za or included the word za. And when I looked on VK, this Russian Facebook, which has 97 million users, so this is a, this is a huge social network in Russia, all of the Z posts that I could find, and I went through really quite a lot, were just selling multi-level marketing products. You know, so you see these things where there's like 100 hashtags on the post and somebody selling some dodgy old claptrap online. All of these things suggest then that although the campaign is visible, there is a lack of organic spread for the campaign. People aren't spreading it themselves. What instead I think we're seeing is a kind of a language of reflexive patriotism. And the problem with war is that war creates disjuncture. War attacks and annihilates meaning. It attacks our understanding of the world and what we expect from the world, and it causes trauma. And then there are generally two responses to this. Either silence, the inability to talk at all. I can't express what I've seen. I can't understand what's happening. I choose to say nothing. Or at the other end of the spectrum, what I'm going to call logoria i.e. words just falling out, an outpouring of stuff that doesn't really mean anything. It's not carefully shaped. And let's look at what that might look like on social media. This is a post from a very large VK group called Vyeshtivayudhi, which means decent people, has close to 400,000 members. And this is a kind of a classic Russian wartime post. This guy, Chernyavsky, is some sapper who um, demines a, a huge amount of supposedly Ukrainian explosives and thus saved lots and lots of people, right? It's a sort of classic story of a military feat. When we look at the responses, these are the top three responses, and you can see they've got quite a lot of likes. Now, the top response says, don't listen to anyone, we'll do anything for our boys, and shares a video that's pulled in somewhere else, from somewhere else, and is simply reshared. The second response to our beloved troops, we're proud of your heroism and bravery. We await your return alive and victorious. We're praying for you. And then you can see the little Russia flag emoji as well. The third response, guys, may God defend you. You'll see there's a lot of religion in here and there's a spiritual dimension in this conflict and an understandings of it that I'm not really going to touch on, but I'd be happy to talk about if people have questions. And I think what we're seeing here is that you can go to any of these posts, any of these Russian groups, and you can find almost the same words, almost the same responses to any story about the war. And the nature of the social media response to war is that it encourages cut and pasting, resharing, sharing, the use of emojis, shorthand, heuristics, simple liking, a kind of by nature engaging in this rather than engagement because we just produce this material so fast. And what you do notice is that in all of this stuff, there is still no Z, right? You don't see the government's campaigns here. Where you see the hashtags used, the ones the government is promoting, the imagery attached to them generally is not Z, but is traditional Russian flags and Russian colors. So these are a couple of examples I pulled off of Instagram. The girl on the left says, I'm not embarrassed for Russia. It's a great and strong nation. And on the right, it says, hashtag Yaruska, I'm Russian. Right? So there's sort of national pride rather than pride in the war and pride around Z and V. Which leads to another problem. The plasticity of Z, the simplicity, the ability to Zize almost anything means that it's constantly subject to a sort of ironic reimagining. On the left-hand side, here is a video I found of a gentleman from the Caucasus so not an ethnic Russian, but a Russian citizen, who asks Zachem, which means, what's this for? As in, why are we bothering to do this? And the video is a two minute drive of him driving around town in whatever city he's in and complaining about the war and saying, this is a waste of time and money. And you can see he's used the Western Z. On the right hand side, again, we see this Zachem in response to the coffee cup where some enterprising uh, coffee store owner in Moscow has produced these za coffee for coffee labels using that Western Z that you can see on the cup. So I think what we're seeing here is that by the government's own efforts 
to create a language that is full of engagingness, that is fragmented, that attacks meaning, that pulls apart an ability to actually engage in depth, we're seeing a kind of creation of absurdity and a fragmentation. And here is a good example of a Russian who's drawing attention to this. You might have seen this because it was in the Western media. He went out to protest. And instead of writing the words, no to war, he simply counted the number of characters in those words, filled them in with asterisks, and was still promptly arrested and tried. And he wasn't sent off to the gulag. He got, I think he got a slap on the wrist, kind of a fine or a few days of arrest. But he's drawing attention to the absurdity and the lack of meaning with which the government is prosecuting its campaigns. So when you're seeing this material spreading widely on social media, what you're actually seeing is a process that we call astroturf. And if you're not familiar with what astroturfing is, it means creating the impression of a grassroots campaign, but it's actually produced or funded or directed by some external actor, i.e. The grass looks real, but when you get close to it, it turns out it's fake, it's astroturfed. So the government is running campaigns that are virally minded. They're using things like flash mobs that appear to be spontaneous. And you might have seen this, this little video of people in Kazan. And I've turned the sound off, but they're, they're chanting for Russia, for peace. And you can see these people are probably bust in, paid or forced to support this. And they hardly look enthusiastic, right? They're not, they're not going for it. And this is typical of the government's youth campaigns in particular. And we might turn our attention to Nashi, which was a nationwide group that existed for a few years and had a, a large amount of members for a while that was funded by the state, labeled as an anti-fascist group, but didn't really do any real work beyond perform and provoke and create images in public. So you can see on the bottom left, there is this very visually striking recreation of a flag. Lots of marches with flags and matching t-shirts, lots of flocking online to troll people and wind people up, but not much creation of engagement. A more modern version is Volunteers for Victory, the Victory, of course, being World War II, but now being applied to Victory in the present. And they've started to borrow the Z campaign. And this is an organization created by the state that attempts to hide its links to the state. And again, has a large amount of members. And I've been maybe lucky enough is not the right word to talk to some of the people running these campaigns in the last few years. And pretty much when you get them in private and ask them, why are you really doing this? They will tell you, I was told I had to do it for grades in university. I was worried I was gonna get expelled or I want to join a particular government department or enter a particular university and I need to do it. I need to have this on my resume. Otherwise I won't get what I want. And when you draw back the veil of what's going on, here we see in a clip from that Luzhniki Stadium um, event, a group of people who are being asked by a journalist, why are you leaving so early? And they say, well, we're not leaving. And the journalists ask, well, can you tell me where you're going? And they simply say, no, I'm not gonna tell you. When you draw back the veil, all of this is performance by people who have to take So you can see here, there is an effort to kind of, you can see from the way the lady is turning away from the camera, she doesn't want to talk about it. She gives the journalist short shrift. But there is certainly no doubt that she wasn't, that she was uh, not particularly enthusiastic, shall we say, about being one of those people in the crowd waving the flag and cheering Putin on. <coughs> on social media, then, the government is using troll farms and volunteer social groups to spread the idea that Z and V are everywhere. And... I'm a member of one of these groups, not that I take part in the activities, but I have a little look at what they're doing every now and again. This is called Cyberfront Z. This is a new group that existed for two or three weeks. 
And what they do is they give out copy paste directions and text to share in English and other languages. So you don't even have to speak English. They tell you where to go. So they'll give you a link to a Facebook group or a VK group or Instagram. So for example, last week they were targeting, there was a big anti-war concert with Russian performers in, uh, in London, in England. And the members of the group were told to go off and basically spam the members, uh, spam the, uh, the performers Instagram feeds with all sorts of offensive stuff and the Z photographs, the Z material. I spoke to a journalist for a Croatian television station who said they've been getting trolled a lot because they're not considered to be pro-Russian enough in an area where Russian support is a sort of still a contentious issue. And they're getting thousands of comments on articles, whereas normally they'd only get 100 or 200. So this veneer of support and engagement, this copy, pasting, liking, sharing, retweeting kind of activity, this is all reflective of something that is reflexive, of these logorrheic utterances of creating something that is designed to show engagingness rather than designed to provoke engagement. So when we think about the question of real engagement, and I'm moving towards a conclusion here, I would say that the state doesn't really want engagement. That is in line with its modus operandi, as Peter Pomerantz has points out, of just creating illusions of crooked mirrors and shattering realities for the last few years. But nor do the population seek real engagement. People are content simply to reshare, to share, to like, to participate as social leverage, to be seen to do the right thing. And to reflect the fact that while the state is kind of performing reality, is putting on the shows, is putting on a display of military performance in Ukraine for its population, the people in return are performing fealty to the state. And I think this is indicative, especially for the millennials, of a waning enthusiasm for the government, especially since 2014 and the invasion of Crimea, the collapse of the Russian economy then, and that's really when the collapse started, a period, this is a period of eight years when younger Russians have increasingly been disengaged with the government's propaganda and cultural materials, feeling like there's nothing new, there's no future. And so when we think about, is Russia going back to the USSR? Is a new fascist movement being born full of sort of terrifying foot soldiers who will do anything for a totalitarian state? I would say, no, the situation looks much more like the USSR in the 1980s when everybody understands that the stability of the state, the rituals and parades of the state, a gossamer thin, and behind the performance lies not much fealty and not much interest in what the state has to offer. However, and this is where I'll leave you. When we think about the future, let's turn our attention not to millennials who are talked about the most because we're interested in social media reaction naturally, but what I'm gonna call the Z generation, the younger generation who are being indoctrinated at levels that will shock you. And I wanna draw your attention to one group, the youth army, Unarmia, who claim to have a million members in Russia, all under the age of 16 and, and have existed for a long time now. And this is basically like Cub Scouts with guns. They run educational programs, sports programs, cultural programs, summer camps, but they also run literal military activity. They train kids to shoot guns. They train them in, for example, I saw drone warfare being brought as a topic. So this is sort of, you know, 20, 21st century meets youth indoctrination. And literally they re-perform the battles of the past. They engage in reenactment of great battles. They might go on summer camp and learn to do Stalingrad, learn to do the battle of Sevastopol, or learn to do battles from the Crimea more recently. And so I think that's the generation we should be asking about. Is this generation who are gonna be more isolated than any generation of Russians has been for a long, long time, who won't have the memories of the pre-2014 hopes and promises of European integration, of travel, of social media? Where are they going? And where, what are they gonna say when the government runs concerts and events like pictured on the right-hand side I have here, 
The text of the sign on the right reads, a great change, a time of new opportunities. What are they going to read into that? What kind of new opportunities are they going to see? So I think I'll, I'll stop there if that's okay. Thanks so much, Ian, for that really interesting talk. So our Q&A is open. Um, so I'll just remind people that if you have a question that you would like to, or Ian, to discuss or touch on, type it in the Q&A. And maybe I'll kick off with, um, you know, just a, a small question here. It's not a small question. <laughs> is the engagingness that you describe dangerous for Russia and the region? And if, I mean, I mean, probably the answer to that is yes, but I, I'd like to hear you sort of speak on it. And also what can be done? Like is counter propaganda from, you know, other states like a possibility or, you know, we know that, you know, the, the Russians have been really good at using social media to interfere in the politics of, of their political rivals. So can, is it possible that the same can be done here to try and save the youth? from, you know, continuing this pattern? So do I think the engagement in this is dangerous? In a word, yes. Yes, of course it is, because all, all you need to do to create something quite frightening within the country is to have a small number of people who are really whipped up and buying into this stuff and living in this sort of fractured social media created. And, you know, I'm thinking, I think I've been reading too much Baudrillard, this this mediated reality that is that is completely distinct and detached from even the reality that the probably the murky middle of Russians who just aren't that interested in this stuff share. Right. If those people and some of the reactions, and I'm thinking in particular, think of the peace talks that we heard about a couple of days ago. And we thought that it was good news and the Russians essentially did a trial balloon of this news and some of the state media outlets and said, well, you know, we might be coming to some kind of compromises here and published a couple of you know, pretty soft steps. And the reaction on the more nationalist telegram channels that I saw to this was really, truly terrifying. And it was a project, a product of engagingness. There was lots of sort of cut and paste Ukrainian scum, Ukrainian vermin, Ukrainians less than human, fuck those Nazis if you'll excuse my French, and stuff that's like way out there that I'm not going to repeat. There's a lot of that stuff. But these people are talking to each other and building each other up into, into a world that is not willing to accept compromises, maybe. So maybe that leads me into the answer to the second question. I, I don't know what we do, in a sense. But what I can say is that the Russian government is clearly, to a certain extent, worried about the propaganda that's being introduced into its country. First, in the sense that, in the most obvious sense, it basically kicked out all the foreign journalists. It's created wild new pe penalties on homegrown journalists, which is just sort of a, an acceleration of what's been happening, especially since the Belarus presidential elections in 2020. But also in a more subtle way, some of the myths and stories that we've been hearing. So, for example, you might have heard about this ghost of Kiev, the uh, the fighter pilot who you know supposedly was downing Russian planes by the bucket load in the in the first week of the war. Well, you'd think that that story would simply be ignored in the Russian media because why would you mention the opposition's heroes? But actually, there was a concerted attack by the Russian press about ten days into the war claiming to debunk the myth of the ghost of Kiev, which suggests that this propaganda is feeding back and must be having an effect on the population if they're bothering to address it. There's been a couple of other examples as well of the same kind of phenomenon. That's great. Actually, we had a similar question here in the Q&A from Hugh Siegel about the seal blocking Western media, whether it's so tight that Russians are living in a separate reality. And then he also says that in the past, legacy media like Voice of America and Radio Canada International could pierce this seal and whether there are options uh, available right now for the West to do so. So I was actually talking about this exact question with a senior editor at the BBC about three weeks ago, and they've decided to extend their shortwave radio coverage in, in Russia 
in, a, in an attempt essentially to, to redo Voice of America, right? And he was really confident that this is going to have some effect. And I think it's a smart move because we're so focused on new media, we're so focused on social media that we forget that if Russians, all the Russians are tuning into television and radio, then the way that we can get them is by producing television and radio for them. The problem is at this stage, are people willing to listen? Because they've been fed this propaganda about Ukrainians being Banderists, Ukrainians being Nazis, Ukrainians and NATO conspiring against them for so long now, and eight years is a long time, that many simply may not be willing to have that seal pierced, even if we actually do show them this information. So I wonder if the answer then is to attempt to do to Russia what Russia has been doing to the West for years, and that is just to flood their information space, space with as much stuff as possible. Right, just throw it all out there, create social media campaigns, trolling, trolling farms essentially of our own. And I, I do suspect I have some indications from folks who are working in military intelligence that Ukrainians are already doing this quite well and that they've been planning to do this just as they've been planning to do a really good job on the battlefield for the last few years. Yeah. Some of what you're saying here is reminding me, too, of what the Anonymous Collective is accomplishing in Russia right now, trying to expose the extent of the rot in the Russian political and economic systems. Another question from the audience. Uh, might Russians look to models from their past, the last 120 years, that is, know-how for building an opposition movement? For example, how to organize a general strike, foment mass troop desertions by troops, such as occurred in World War II, build a clandestine cell-based network. Um, and, and the person, this is from Julie, says, thanks, great talk as well. Oh, this, is, this is a really difficult question. And I think all of those might provide obvious models and we're already hearing rumors. And I, I've got to really stress all the stuff you're hearing about things that are happening on the battlefield. So much of it is rumor and mistruth and misinformation from both sides. Perhaps you'll be really careful. We are hearing rumors that Russian troops have low morale and there are, there are defections, people running away, people just getting lost and walking back to Russia. People refusing to go to people refusing to go to Ukraine to fight, and I, I'm not sure how true they are, but you do wonder. There's no smoke without at least a little bit of fire, right? Especially when we're talking about a low information conscript army. Although the Russians say they're not using conscripts, they most definitely are. But let me let me put back a more worrying question to you, and that is: given what we've seen in Hong Kong, for example, recently where we saw a truly mass protest movement opposing the authoritarian state, vast protests, lots of people occupying the streets that ultimately ended in nothing because the surveillance state was powerful enough, especially when married to its physical muscle to simply end those protests. Can the Russians do the same, especially given Look at the way that Belarus has dealt with the opposition in the last two years. It's been ruthless and it's been, and here is the key, arbitrary. The violence meted out has not targeted the opposition. And the Chinese in Hong Kong mostly have targeted real opposition figures. But in Belarus, they've literally just been picking people off the street and throwing them in jail as a display of raw power. And what you see when you saw... I don't know if anyone watched Putin's speech from a couple of weeks ago, I think it was the 16th of March when he started to talk about fifth columnists and traitors. The language he was using around cleansing was the language of the 1930s. It was a language of the purges. And again, today, there was a big article on the front page of Pravda about anybody who questions the state essentially shouldn't be working for the state, should be fired and jailed. And so creating this, they're trying to create this atmosphere of real fear in the country. And so on the one hand, you create this veneer of support, the Z and the V campaigns. And yet at the same time, you're also showing people that you're not, you're not messing around. And so you wonder what it's going to take to produce something that is a mass troop desertion or a general strike or something similar. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's good. Um, from David Schroeder, is it possible to see if the campaign or campaigns are gaining any traction or impact in the wider Russian diaspora, or is it solely being seen inside the Russian Federation itself? So that's a really good question. It's actually something I haven't looked into that much because I'm the problem we always have with trying to interpret things through through networks like Telegram is that nobody is who they says they are, right, or who they say they are. It's really hard to figure out if a Russian speaker really is a Russian Russian speaker or if this is a Russian diaspora member. So we've got to be careful with this stuff. And, and we've seen a little bit of this. There was some, I believe, a campaign, a, a protest in Vancouver where there were some Russian speakers sort of had latched on to you, the, the anti-vax protest and mixed that with a sort of Ukraine war is a hoax protest. And there was some Z and V imagery there, I think. So these things are spreading. I think there's probably a, a market is the wrong is the wrong word for it, but there is there is an audience of Russians who might be engaging with this stuff, perhaps our own fifth column outside of Russia. Mm, yeah. Do you see a rural urban divide in support and enthusiasm for the Z movement? Good, I like this question because this, this question is a bit easier to answer. And the answer is the urban areas that are higher information, better educated, wealthier, and have more connections to the abroad, and in particular, have more smartphones and iPhones, are substantially more likely to be anti-government, to be questioning of the government's narratives. Not exclusively. Again, thinking back to those wealthy young Russians who want to go to the fancy universities, who want to get into the, the right government department and make a career that way. They may choose to engage with campaigns, and, and I think there are plenty of patriotic believers there, but in the, in the rural areas, which are really, in Russia, if you haven't been, you don't know much about the country, then once you leave the big cities, it is like going back in time. It is a poverty-stricken nation. It, it is just really striking visually to go and to learn about the conditions that Russians live in. But these people, as is the case with rural voters in many places, tend to cleave to patriotic beliefs and nationalist beliefs. Yeah, that's true. That's sort of like a universalism, isn't it? Like in, in you know, cutting across many areas for sure. Um, okay, another question, this time from Cynthia. Recently, Arnold Schwarzenegger posted a video to the Russians. Do you think it will have any impact or influence? <laughs> I loved this video. If you haven't watched this video, please go and watch it. It's like eight or nine minutes long. And Arnie talks about the war, but in a brilliant rhetorical move, he talks about seeing a Soviet era weightlifter when he was a boy who was at a, some championship meet in, I guess, Austria when he was growing up, who's a big national hero in Russia still. And when there is a big culture of powerlifting and a very macho culture, an aggressive militaristic culture, and basically said, this guy was my hero. I wanted to be just like him. And then, you know, leads into, please don't do the war. Don't be, you know, don't buy the bad stuff, buy the good stuff. So it's, it's a really, really clever video. Just on, on Twitter, I called it laser focused to destroy Russian toxic masculinity. And Arnie is extremely popular in Russia, right? I mean, he's extremely popular everywhere, but these sorts of action movie figures, Steven Seagal in particular, very popular in Russia, right? The question is, will it have any impact or influence? And I suspect not. It briefly trended on, um, on Telegram, including like the, the Russian speaking area of Telegram, but then it disappeared. And I haven't I haven't seen it since the initial flurry of interest. It was on it was on the Google search trending as well. So it was quite high up there for a day or two. But since then, it's just sort of disappeared into the fractured social media ether. These things come and go and the viral stories blow up and disappear again. Yeah, it's true. It's difficult to gain traction with sort of any one effort or um, communication. Oh, a question from Nadia Varelli. Wonderful. What role, if any, does the Navalny team or opposition team play with youth? Do they have any influence over the youth? Depressing answer, very little. 
videos very wide, videos very widely watched because they're really well produced and they're often quite tabloid in style you know here's 30 minute shocking expose of putin's palace in sochi and it's like it's snappy instagram era stuff but when you look at navalny's popularity whether people even recognize navalny's name well it's, it's higher amongst younger russians but it's still not very high and still younger russians as a whole tend to talk more about Putin than they talk about Navalny. And, and one of the brilliant things that Putin has done, brilliant in the sense of being an evil mastermind, um, has done over the last few years is, is fragment the opposition to such an extent that there's nobody. There really is no figure, no person, nobody speaking to Russians inside or outside of Russia. And I was having a really interesting discussion with Boris Dralyuk, who's the editor of the Los Angeles Review of Books and grew up in Odessa. We were talking about Russian protest movements and the extent to which Russian protests over the last hundreds, 150 years have tended to revolve around sacrifice, right? The idea that I'm gonna die for my cause, but without actually achieving much, which renders all of this, if we're talking about performance and if we're talking about display and image, what does the performance really, really achieve? And so when we think about Navalny, who has offered himself up as this sacrificial lamb, this martyr for the nation by choosing to return to Russia, even though he knew he was going to get chucked in jail forever, and he got a new prison sentence of yet another nine years added onto his sentence two weeks ago, and he'll never leave while Putin is in power, you do have to ask, what's, what's he really achieved? What is he hoping to achieve beyond sacrificing himself? What happens when he sacrificed himself? Who steps into that void? Yeah. Sorry, all discussions about Russia tend to <laughs> lead us towards these, these really bleak conclusions, right? Yeah, well, I doubt anyone came here today at lunchtime looking for opt or expecting optimism, right? <laughs> another, uh, I'm gonna ask another question actually. Oh. So for the Russian state, given all that you've said, why promote the Z campaign? Like, why not? There, there's plenty of symbolism or sort of slogans or historical events that can be re revived to energize and mobilize the people towards um, the special operation in Ukraine. Why invent something new? Why reinvent the wheel? Basically, it doesn't seem very smart. And that's the thing. I don't think it is very smart. My first reaction when I saw the campaign was to think of two things, and that is, no, it's three things, I apologize. Very first reaction, this looks like Zorro. Yeah, like, sh 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 yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Which was a big movie in Russia as well, right? So everybody would, would recognize that. Secondly, why are you using the first letter of your big opposition leader, Zelensky, who is turning out to be a folk hero amongst some elements of the Russian population as, you know, your big campaign. And thirdly, why are you using a Western letter in a war that is supposedly about this great clash of existential values? It doesn't make sense. And it just strikes me when we go back to this ad hoc thinking, they realized that, you know, we thought this was all gonna be over. We wouldn't have to do much, that we'd be having a big victory parade on the 18th of March at Luzhniki Stadium, which is the anniversary of the annexation of Crimea, by the way, which may be why they launched the invasion then, Putin will have the new Ukrainian president on stage. Our troops will be marching through Kiev. People will be coming out onto the streets, clapping and applauding. We don't need to think about Z and V campaigns and selling this war to people because that's gonna be the proof. That's gonna be how we sell it, right? We've saved the world from fascists yet again. And I have a sense probably they were just panicking. There's threw something at the wall and now they're running with it and hoping it takes off. Goodness. Um, yeah, so they were sort of caught with their pants down, I suppose, in a way. <laughs> and what we're learning from this, this war in general is that, again, the Russian state has been performing competence and brilliance to us for years, just as it performs to its own people. It has a reputation that is deliberately sought to build as this sort of evil mastermind playing 12 dimensional chess, one step ahead, social media, savvy, surgical 
nation with a great army full of modern weaponry and flashy videos. But actually, the army's underperformed, the social media has underperformed, they haven't managed to sell the war to anybody in the West, really. Beneath, beneath the surface, you see something that looks really like it's creaking. But yet, paradoxically, we can't see a way where it can be avoided, quashed, or diverted. And this is this is why I think of the USSR in the 1980s, where we sort right. of see a slow unraveling, and yet it seems like there is a great book by, if anyone's interested, Alexei Yurchak, which is called Everything is Forever Until It's No More, which is about exactly this question. How does it look so impregnable, so like it's forever, and yet it's unraveling and chaotic and seems to be collapsing before our very eyes? So again, very easy easy book to read, really engaging and yet very profound at the same time. Yeah, that does sound really good. Um, well, we've like more or less sort of reached the end of our time here. Ian, thank you so much for this. Um, and thanks for your expertise and really look forward to the book coming out. Uh, so everyone who's interested in, you know, sort of analyses of Russian culture and propaganda and how it's used in war and politics, the book's coming out this year with McGill Queens University Press. Um, so thanks everyone for joining and uh, happy Friday. Thank you, everybody. Take care. Bye. Thanks.